Sora, Sora, Sora. This has got to be the most controversial AI software so far. So it produces absolutely incredible video, text to video. So it uses AI neural nets. You type in a prompt and it produces video. And it's far and away the best AI video platform of its kind right now. It's not released to the public, but from what we're seeing, it's very, very good. And this just got announced today. So Sora first impressions, and OpenAI saying we have gained valuable feedback from the creative community, helping us to improve our model. And they've been working with visual artists, designers, creative directors, and filmmakers to learn how Sora might aid in the creative process. Now, if you haven't been following along, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of emotions on both sides. OpenAI is talking to Hollywood, trying to get them to start using Sora. A lot of artists out there are very upset. At the same time, of course, a lot of people are extremely excited. I mean, I can't wait to get my hands on something like this and be able to produce these incredible, stunning images, these short clips that you can, you know, tie together into a movie. You can use something like Eleven Labs to produce voices. Actually, as we're talking, there's rumors that OpenAI will have their own voice platform, voice engine, as they refer to it. If you've been playing around with some of the voices on ChatGPT, they are very, very real. They pause and exhale and go, um, in the, in, in all the right places. Um, so next they continue. They're quoting some of the people that have got their hands on this thing. So Paul Trio director saying Sora is, is at its most powerful when you're not replicating the old, but bring to life new and impossible ideas we would have otherwise never had the opportunity to see. And certainly this little weird, weird, weird clip, I think kind of shows that. I, I like this fox grow, the cat. This is bizarre. So they have an octopus slash whale. They call it an elegant bl blend of whale and octopus. I think it's a nightmarish blend of whale and octopus. Yeah, I mean, some of these are absolutely insane. This crow fox thing is 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 incredible. I like it. I like it. It's cute. This, this is probably one of my favorite <laughs> animals on here. The rest of them, the whale octopus or as they say, the elegant blend of whale and octopus. That's a nightmare. That's a nightmarish creature that is very scary. I like cats. I don't know if I'm cool with this eel cat thing. Even this is kind of bizarre. An armadillo as a buddy. I love how they merged, how the AI managed to merge it. In a way, I mean, this seems seamless to me. This looks very real. This horse fly thing is obviously incredibly bizarre but as you can tell i mean this isn't right but certainly like the guy said we're not recreating the old this is this is brand brand new this air balloon thing that's from uh shy kids i guess they called it airhead so this one i couldn't play because there was some uh copyright issues and stuff like that but i'll leave this link if you want to see every single video i also have another video that i just posted that has some of these that are that don't trigger copyright uh warnings on there that you can see I'll, I'll i'll play it right after this video but the people that made this airhead video are saying shy kids as great as sore is at generating things that appear real what excites us is the ability to make things that are totally surreal and that's a good word for it surreal so shy kids the people behind airhead are saying so they're based in toronto they're a multimedia production company who utilize sora for their short film about a balloon man we now have the ability to expand on stories we once thought impossible. Shares the trio made up of Walter Woodman, Sydney Leader, and Patrick Cedarberg. Walter, who directed Airhead, remarks that as great as stories as generate things that appear real, what excites us is the ability to make things that are totally surreal. A new era of abstract expressionism. Speaking to the wider industry, people from all over the world with stories ready to burst out of their chests finally have the opportunity to show the world what's inside. And this is kind of what I've been saying. So there's a lot of people, artists, that are mad at this, that this is happening. They're saying that this is a, a heist, a scam, that they're basically ripping off artists by training on their data. And now they're going to turn around and put those artists out of business. And so that's one side of the argument. And people on the other side are saying, well, the benefits are that more people all of the world will be able to create the stories, the visions that they have in their head without needing massive amounts of capital, without needing access to, you know, the Hollywood elite to have connections in Hollywood. If they have a great idea, they can create it. They can put it out to the world. And, you know, with social media, with YouTube, with Twitter X, with all that stuff, they can see if it gets traction. I feel a lot of the 
movies that are produced right now, I feel like the level of creativity is going down. It's mostly remakes, very little original content. And none of it is very good. I mean, I understand that's my opinion, but everything is churning into, you know, how to make profit. So is it really still art at that point? If you're just cranking out the same rehash stuff as that artistic, are you producing art? Are you an artist or, or is it just a factory that's making widgets? I would love to see somebody that, for example, loved some original sci-fi books or loved the original Game of Thrones, take that idea and use something like this to create their version of it, to create their own world. And OpenAI is going out to Hollywood, meeting of Hollywood studios and talent agencies to work on Sora integration. CEO Sam Altman attended parties during Oscar week to start making inroads. Does that guy sleep? I feel like he's always, always up to something. According to OpenAI, Sora is an artificial intelligence model that can create realistic and imaginative scenes from text instruction. Currently, the technology produces realistic computer animations lasting about a minute in length, which by the way is impressive. Somebody that's been following this for quite some time. I mean, this is kind of the big video that I think opened a lot of people's eyes to what was possible. So this video is 59 seconds long, so just about a minute. It's generated in Sora, and it's beyond anything else that's out there. Because notice the reflection on the streets, the reflection of the water, the consistency, the 3D structure consistency, the character consistency, the letters are staying where they are. You can tell this is the same street that she's working on. No one in the background is like blinking in and out of existence. Yeah, I mean, look at the reflection in the in the glasses. Like the AI model has a representation of where it is in the world and it's generating those images with very high fidelity. Now, of course, there's, you know, people have pointed out some issues with it, like something someone pointed out that there's like these two kind of vanishing points here that are going different directions, which I guess, which I guess, I don't know, I guess that's wrong. I have no idea. Uh, also, I mean, you can kind of see the legs, the feet sometimes kind of slipping and sliding. So like the friction on the floor feels a little bit weird. So, you know, so there's like tiny little weirdness things here and there, but I got to say, it's getting very, very close to near perfect reality. And of course, we've seen kind of some of the fallout that's happening from this. So for example, Tyler Perry puts an 800 million studio expansion on hold after seeing OpenAI's Sora. He's saying jobs are going to be lost. As a business owner, Perry sees the opportunity in these developments, but as an employer, fellow actor and filmmaker, he also wants to raise an alarm. In an interview between Shoots Thursday, Perry explained his concerns about the technology's impact on labor and why he wants the industry to come, to, to come together to tackle AI. There's got to be some sort of regulation in order to protect us. If not, I just don't see how we survive. And they've asked them, what in particular was so shocking to you about its capabilities, which I'm not the only one that uses this word. People get a lot of flack for saying shocking. It's shocking. Some of this stuff is shocking. I mean, the fact that you can create something like this as fast as it takes you to write it out onto, you know, to type it out. I mean, that is kind of shocking, isn't it? It's kind of changes the paradigm, as they say, doesn't it? Maybe I'm just easily shocked, but he's saying, why is it so shocking what Sora is doing? He's saying, I no longer have to travel to locations. If I wanted to be in the snow in Colorado, it's text. If I want to write a scene on the moon, it's text. If I want to have two people living in the mountains, I don't have to build a set in the mountains, right? And this is, you know, if you want to shoot on, you know, on location in Tokyo, you shoot on location in Tokyo, but it goes deeper than that, right? Because the people that make the cameras and the equipment and the lenses and the microphones, well, you also don't need them. You don't need the sets, the 3D effects, you know, the special macro photography photo equipment, the special glass that is made for those. So it isn't just one thing. It's it's a lot of things that are affected by this. So this next video is Paul Trillo, who's a multidisciplinary artist, writer, and director whose work has earned accolades from outlets like The Rolling Stone and The New Yorker. Paul has garnered 19 Vimeo staff picks, an, art, an honor given to the best short films hosted on Vimeo. Working with Sora is the first time I felt unchained as a filmmaker, not restricted by time, money, or other people's permission. Well said, good sir. I have to agree. It unchains you from the limitations that you have as an artist, not restricted by time, money, or other people's permission, right? Most of the movies now, you have to please some committee or you have to, you have to prove to them that, you know, 
your idea makes sense. You got to convince this guy to uh, give you a role on the movie. Or if you have a good idea, if you have talent, if you have creativity, use Sora. You're not restricted by time, money, or other people's permission. Paul Trio continues. He's saying, I can ideate and experiment in bold and exciting ways. His experimental videos reflect this approach. Sora is at its most powerful when you're not replicating the old, but bringing to life new and impossible ideas we would have otherwise never had the opportunity to see. Here's Nick Clavera of Creative Director, Native Foreign. So Native Foreign is an Emmy-nominated creative agency from LA, specializing in brand storytelling, motion and type design and generative AI workflows. Nick is using Sora to visualize concepts and rapidly iterate on creative for brand partners. He suggests that budgetary constraints no longer have to entirely shape the narrative of creativity. I'm one of those creatives that thinks in motion. So when I'm in Sora, it really feels like I can bring any idea to life. Next, we have August Camp is a musician, researcher, creative activist, and multidisciplinary artist. He says, Sora represents a real turning point for me as an artist whose scope has always been limited by imagination being at odds with means. She explains, being able to build and iterate on cinematic visuals, this intuitively has opened up categorically new lanes of artistry to me. I truly cannot wait to see what other forms of storytelling will come into reach with the future of these tools. Josephin Miller is the co-founder and creative director of Lund-based Orar Studio, specializing in the design of 3D visuals, augmented reality, and digital fashion. Oh, I guess so this is like a fashion thing. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it's very, very interesting. The, 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 this whole thing makes a lot more sense to me from a, like, a fashion perspective. Sora has opened up the potential to bring to life ideas I've had for many years. Ideas that were previously technically impossible. I mean, certainly, if you want to take uh, a model, put a heavy, heavy glass dress on them and then have the photo shoot underwater, I feel like that would be kind of hard to, uh, you know, for insurance and liability purposes, I feel like that would be pretty difficult. I mean, she continues, the ability to rapidly conceptualize at such a high level of quality is not only challenging my creative process, but also helping me evolve in storytelling. It's enabling me to translate my imagination with fewer technical constraints. This is a big deal. This is a big point because what we oftentimes see is when people are forced to iterate quickly. If there's no, if they have to produce faster, iterate faster, and that feedback loop becomes faster, the rate at which they grow and expand and innovate tends to be a lot faster. The various constraints of having to go on location to travel there, to set up, to wait for, you know, that golden hour, the right sunlight or whatever. Yes, that's part of the creative process, but imagine if you could just produce, 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 put it out there, gather feedback and iterate and keep doing that. And if any kid anywhere in the world could do that, do you think, do you think the quality of content that we would have access to, would that be better? Or do we have access to better content when only a few individuals with the right money and the right connections are able to produce it? I don't know about you, but I tend to watch a lot more individual creators on YouTube nowadays than I do anything by a particular actor or Hollywood studio. Now, just a quick disclaimer, none of my annoyances with Hollywood apply to Quentin Tarantino. His stuff is still the exception. His stuff is unquestionably good. The rest of the stuff that gets produced, eh, not so much. Next, we have Don Allen Stevenson III. Starting his career at DreamWorks Animation, Don Allen III is a multidisciplinary creator, speaker, and consultant who collaborates with major tech and entertainment companies on mixed reality, virtual reality, and AI applications. I'm guessing uh, he's in a good field for that right now. He's saying, for a long time, I've been making augmented reality hybrid creatures that I think would be, would be fun combinations in my head. Now I have a much easier way of prototyping the ideas before I fully build out the 3D characters to place them to place in spatial computers. Don cites Sora's weirdness as its great strength. It's not bound by traditional laws of physics or conventions of thought. He says that working with Sora shifted his focus from technical hurdles to pure creativity, unlocking a world of instant visualization and rapid prototyping. At the same time, Don says, I feel like this allows me to focus more on my time and energy in the right places and the emotional impact that I would like my characters to have. Again, and this is an artist that's trying to create the ideas that he has on his set to try to produce it and put them out there in the world. He's saying with this, the limitations are broken. He can do more. He can do it faster. Alexander Rebin is an artist who has spent the last decade creating work that explores the humor and absurdity of human nature and artificial intelligence. 
Alex has been creating sculptures that originate from AI-generated imagery, manually transforming those AI creations into 3D models materialized in the physical world. My experience of using Sora was as a starting point to develop 3D sculpture. My thoughts drifted towards exploring the realm of photogrammetry and its potential applications to sculpture. The prospect of transforming video into 3D models intrigued me as it hinted at propelling the AI system beyond its initial scope. Now, keep this in mind and what this person, Don Allen, was saying. It's important to understand that there's already things like, there's certain like NVIDIA technology, for example, among many others, that are able to take these images and very quickly translate them into 3D environments, like virtual video game, like 3D environments. So with a lot of this stuff, taking this stuff and turning into a virtual reality game or a just a regular kind of 3D game, that's likely the kind of the next frontier that's coming, the next big wave. Once we are able to create whatever we can visualize in our heads in Sora, we can take a lot of that stuff out and translate that into 3D worlds, video games, virtual reality, etc. Now, by the way, we still don't really know what Sora was uh, trained on, what training data, data they used. A lot of people in the comments here are kind of complaining that that's not revealed, right? As a one poster here says, never ask a woman her age, a man his salary, or an AI company where they got their training data, which if you missed that, this is this is Mir Marathi at OpenAI, uh, Chief Technology Officer of OpenAI, kind of made an interesting face when uh, they asked her about the training data. A lot of people, of course, are assuming that they're taking their visuals from artists. Uh, looking at all these images, I, I don't think so. I think that is probably true for the AI art generators. I mean, Midjourney and Stable Diffusion, like as far as I know, we don't know where they're getting their sort of training data. It's probably whatever pictures or images that they have access to. Sora, I don't know. I've had some speculations in my previous videos. I I think one theory that kind of appeals to me is they're using synthetic data. They're not using real world imagery. They're using something that's produced like a video game-like design. Certainly video games are getting very photorealistic nowadays. I mean, in this image, the the fluid, the fluid physics, the reflections, this, this looks like a video game. I don't think there's that much footage of two little miniature pirate ships floating. This is a coffee cup, right? This is coffee with the kind of that foamy coffee thing that's floating around. There, there's not too many real world footage of this. I mean, here, look at this kind of like third perspective walking behind them. I mean, how much footage of stuff like this exists in the real world? I would say maybe not so much. How much of footage like this exists in video games? Tons and tons and tons. Like many, many, many video games are, are made with this perspective, right? So if you're able to kind of feed in synthetic footage of something like this and then have the AI, the neural nets learn from it and try to adapt it to other footage that it's seen, I don't know. That seems very plausible to me. I've recently launched a forum so we can all kind of chat about some of these ideas. It's free. You have to register to contribute to it, but anybody can just see all the conversations that we're having in there. So I'll link it down below. It's natural20.com. And one of the biggest kind of discussions that blew up, as you can see here, over 100 replies already. So we have the title is Generative AI is the biggest heist in the whole history of human creativity, saying that basically with these AI neural nets, Artistically untalented people stole the work of all the talented ones so they can use malfunctions to approximate the art of others and calling it their own. And we obviously have tons and tons of people, very drastically different opinions. And obviously, I, it's obvious to me that we're very divided and there aren't any simple answers here. We have people that think that this is basically stealing from artists, that it's a heist. We have people that see this as this incredible unchaining that is uh, given to them. They're no longer restricted by by others, by money, by time. We have people, I mean, Tyler Perry is one example, but I mean, obviously he's not the only one, but you know, he's probably speaking on behalf of his employees saying, I feel like everybody in the industry is running a hundred miles an hour to try to catch up and try to put in guardrails. So some people are just, so some people are more worried about like the jobs going away. In our last video, we did cover so the person that I first heard this idea from was Jan LeCun from, from Meta slash Facebook, the senior AI researcher over there. So he was saying that, you know, for example, the Ottoman Empire banned the printing press because they wanted to 
keep the scribes, the, the people that were like printing and writing these books and copying these books by hand, they were saying, well, this thing is just going to put them out of business and we want them to keep making these books so that they're very, you know, because they're so, so precious and the books are made so much better because of it. And this is just, you know, this machine that's going to take away their ability to do that. I was able to find that quote. So this is Jan LeCun of Meta. So a very strong proponent of open source AI. So he's saying the UAE minister of AI points to a historical precedent of premature technology regulation motivated by fear. The ban of the printing press in 1515 by Sultan Salim, the first, I'm guessing, uh, led to the decline of the Ottoman Empire. We over-regulated in technology. So I believe this is Omar al Olama. So we know him from the the time that Sam Altman uh, attended virtually a conference that they had over there, and uh, they kind of went back and forth talking about the importance of regulating this correctly. So I believe this is a tribute to him. He's saying, we over-regulated a technology, which was the printing press. It was adopted everywhere on earth. The Middle East banned it for 200 years. The calligraphers came to the Sultan and said, we're going to lose our jobs. Do something to protect us, right? Right. There was this disruptive technology, the printing press that was like gaining traction all over the world. But the scribes, the calligraphers are saying, hey, we don't want to lose our jobs. Let's let's uh, let's put some guardrails in place. Right. So job loss protection, very similar to AI. The religious scholars said people are going to print fake versions of the Quran and corrupt society. Right. Misinformation. Second reason. It was the fear of the unknown that led to this faithful decision. So obviously there's a lot of parallels here between AI and printing press. Right. People are saying, hey, we're going to lose our jobs. You know, this AI is bad. We're going to lose our jobs. They took our jobs. And of course, we've seen, and of course, the other big thing that people are saying, well, misinformation, they're going to print fake fake versions of these books, of our religious books, right? Now they're saying the same thing. Well, they're going to print fake versions of, you know, the president saying something. So obviously a lot of parallels to from the printing press to the AI. Now, of course, different people are going to have different takes about, you know, the printing press and the Ottoman Empire, but, you know, I think a lot of people are saying, well, this is one of the reasons that led to the decline of the Ottoman Empire. While the rest of the world flourished with knowledge and access to more books, their need to save the calligraphers' jobs, their being afraid of, you know, misinformation that led to them, that fear led to them closing off and basically missing out on this growth. So this AI safety meme is basically saying, well, it's very different. Jan LeCun is answering printed books and AI systems both serve to enable better access to knowledge. Not only that, but also to, it gives more people access to being able to create, to create art, to create visuals. They both make people smarter, more creative, and more productive. That's intrinsically good. That's the reality. Scenarios of AI-fueled doom are imaginary bullshit. This guy does not pull any punches, does he? You got to give it to Jan LeCun. I, I don't agree with him on everything, but there's some people out there that are very straightforward and they stick to what they believe, and, and he's definitely one of those people. He's saying it's just new forms of medieval obscurantism. And this person jumps in saying, I love that we live in a society where the CEO of a top three global AI lab will gleefully take the time to shoot down a drawing of an octopus with too many eyes, right? So this sort of, what do they call it? The Shogoth. He's saying, I like this simulation. I hope we don't get turned off. You and me both, buddy. You and me both. So it looks like uh, somebody pointed out that it was just, it was allowed, but not for the Arabic scripts which resulted in, in the Middle East, you know, being a few printing presses, printing mostly Hebrew and Aramaic. I mean, can you imagine how different the world would be if that wasn't the decision? Imagine loading up a simulation, going back to 1515 and just having this guy go, yeah, my dudes, we're all in on this printing press. We're going to accelerate the printing press to the moon. And then fast forward to today's date, how different would the world look? But at this point, let me ask you, what do you think? I feel like we're we're going to be facing a lot of decisions here as a as a nation as as the world in fact how do we want to approach this new innovative and highly highly disruptive technology will we put guardrails in to protect the various jobs because AI is going to be coming for a lot of jobs let's say we say well it can't produce movies all right what about writing and translating should we say well it can't translate stuff for us because the translators need their jobs can't write books for us because Writers need their jobs. It can't write code because coders need their jobs. And as AI capabilities expand, do we just keep regulating it further and further out of existence? What if some other countries don't? If we fast forward 10, 20 years, 
what does that look like? I'm not trying to push a viewpoint here. I'm kind of saying there are no easy answers. A good close friend of mine uh, from childhood, I knew him for a very, very long time, went to school for animation just recently. Very creative person, did a lot of music and drawing, picked up animation. And so when Sora started coming out and making waves, I thought, well, he's probably not going to be too happy. He's probably going to be upset that he spent so much time learning to do something that maybe isn't going to be as applicable, something that won't be as valuable on the, you know, job marketplace. To his credit, I was, I was pleasantly surprised, positively shocked, if you will, that he was extremely excited about Sora and was asking me how he can get his hands on it. He can't wait to use this to create the visions that he has in his head, to translate his ideas into actual reality, to produce the stories and ideas that he has. And I gotta say, I'm, I'm in his boat, if you will. I can't wait to get my hands on it and see what others can create with this. If there are no limitations, then the people with the best stories, the best creativity, their art, their work will flow to the top, regardless of their geographical area or their money or their connections or anything like that. They won't have to run their ideas by some committee. They'll just be able to produce incredible, stunning visuals and share it with the rest of the world. I don't know about you, I for one am very bullish on this, very excited. I can't wait for this to be rolled out to the rest of the world. And if that's not your cup of coffee, then I understand. I think that is a valid perspective. And I think we do need to think about how to manage everything as this thing gets summoned into our world. With that said, my name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.